So it's a big honor for me to be here. And um, uh, today, I would like, as a mathematician, I would like to speak about a future of uh, mathematics. And maybe as a scientist, I also would like to share with uh, you a little bit what is mathematics and how mathematicians uh, see it. And so, but uh, of, course, of course, anticipating the future of science is extremely difficult and might be even impossible. And so just to give you an example of how this might work, let me take you back to the past. And so as uh, Maureen already presented me, so my uh, own work is the, the work I became most famous about is the work on the sphere packing. So let me share with you the history of the sphere packing problem. And so this, uh, the sphere packing problem started as a very applied scientific problem. So um, a British uh, aristocrat planned on invading Spain and asked his scholar a very simple applied question. How many cannonballs can he put into a deck of a ship? Uh, so this is the legend of how the... Uh, the problem of sphere packing appeared in our European history and European science. And the scientist Thomas Herriot, he found this problem actually very interesting, and he thought about it and wrote several letters about it. Um, so he found those densest uh, sphere packings or cannonballs packings, as you can see them on a picture below. But also this problem made him think about, so maybe the way the... Uh, Cannonballs are packed inside of the ship. Maybe this is how atoms are packed in a co condensed bodies. And in 17th century, of course, the atomistic theory, this was the science of the, like the science fiction science of the future. Very mysterious, very uh, hot topic. And so he was thinking about this and shared his ideas uh, with his colleague, Johannes Kepler. And we still have these like, letters between two uh, scholars of 17th century, and uh, Kepler really liked this idea, and he also started thinking about packing uh, spheres and also about many things around us, like cannonballs, or the snowflakes, or honeycombs, or maybe atoms inside of uh, condensed matter, which, of course, people at that time could no, had no chance of seeing. And so he thought about what could be a formational principle, what could be the explanation. And so he thought that maybe this problem, that the, maybe the uh, snowflakes have exactly six edges, and so he named his essay as an essay on a sixth-edged uh, snowflake, or maybe why uh, uh, bees build their honeycombs the way they, they build them. So here they also can see this in honeycombs, we can see the small hexagons. or uh, how we uh, pack the cannonballs. So, so there, if you take each layer of the cannonballs, each of these layers, it also it's a hexagonal layer. And he thought that maybe the sphere packing problem is responsible for this. Maybe that's because the solution to sphere packing problem is this solution. And now, looking from the 21st century, we know that actually in most of these examples, he was wrong. So he was right only about the cannonballs. And we know, actually, right now, we have an pretty good idea of why snowflakes have exactly six edges, and that's a totally different reason. And we also know why honeycombs, why bees build honeycombs the way they do it, and that's because they try to save vex, and that's also some, that's not a pecking problem, it's actually saving the vex problem. Uh, however, the idea itself turned to be very fruitful, and for many centuries it was known in mathematics as a Kepler's conjecture. And as an abstract mathematical problem, again, maybe I, I should tell you something about mathematicians. When there is a mathematical problem that we cannot solve, we get extremely anxious. It's like something is missing in our world. And so for almost 400 centuries, mathematicians attacked this question as a purely mathematical abstract question. And the solution was found only at the end of 20th century by American mathematician Thomas Hales. So he was the person who gave a final solution, and before his solution, there have been many announcements and always some mistake in the proof was found. Uh, but he finally settled down the puzzle, so maybe that's the end of the story of sphere packing, but that's actually just the beginning. 
Uh, so his proof itself turned out to be an extremely interesting case because what he could have done, he, of his proof of this uh, geometric problem is extremely geometric, and he uh, deduced it to solution of many optimization problems. But each of these problems, it was too difficult to solve it by hand, and he had, for many of them, he had to use computer. And so uh, the final proof that he published, it was a computer-assisted proof. And among mathematicians, this raised a huge debut. So before, because before that, the maybe iconic image of a mathematician is a person who sits in front of a notebook and writes arguments, of course, doing this by logic and reasoning, but this has to be done by a person. And this time, we get a, a solution of an important problem, and the solution is done, okay, it's not done by a computer, but computer was a really essential part in the solution. Without computer, it's it would be impossible to obtain the solution, but also impossible to verify that it is correct. And this raised a huge debut among mathematicians. And for several years, the paper was not accepted for publication. It was verified, it was discussed. And so this uh, led Thomas Hales to the following interesting project, which is called the Flying Speck Project, which is the system of computer uh, automa uh, automated and computer assisted, uh, uh, computer verified proofs. So now the mathematical proof is not written as an essay, which uh, another mathematician or another human can read. It can be written as a computer program, and this computer program can be verified by a computer. And of course, computers never get bored, never get tired. So they, uh, they, they will re we will be sure that they really did the referring work and did not just uh, put it on the table for several months. Never happened to me. And. Uh, uh, so, uh, and of, of course, this is maybe one example how a problem of packing cannonballs into a ship could lead us to the concept of com computer verified proof. And I'm sure that in 17th century, people had absolutely no chance of anticipating such a turn of uh, events. And so, maybe he. So he, this maybe brings us to ideas So what is the origin and what is also the value of abstract idea, in particular of a mathematical idea. And so maybe the way I would like to think of it is that we have actually two worlds. And one of them is the real world where we all live and where we have all these pressing issues, conflicts, terrible problems to resolve. But we also have the world of abstract ideas where actually nothing, where everything is uh, quiet and stable and where we are on perfect control of everything. And so these two worlds, they're connected to each other. It's like a mirror, but it's not a usual mirror, but it's more like a magic mirror of the, the Alice was able to go through. And so everything what we see in the real world, of course, it has its counterpart in the abstract world. But abstract world lives by its own rules. And so we can take an idea from real world, bring it to this abstract realm of the curved mirror, and actually change it there and play with it. And it, then it becomes a purely abstract object which can be manipulated by logic and reasoning. And here, the, this is like a game that mathematicians play, and maybe as a um, previous speaker told us, so should we let scientists play with their toys? Should we trust them? And maybe let me convince you that yes, we should. And that's because these methods from apps, this, uh, ab objects of abstract world, often we can bring them back into reality. And not only to bring them back as inventions, but actually we can look by something in our real world with different eyes by just having those abstract concepts. And so one example of this journey is that we started with the cannonballs. We thought of them as an abstract sphere packings, and then with the thought of abstract sphere packings, they thought about the law, laws of reasoning, and this led us to the computer-assisted proofs. And here's another example, which actually is very uh, practical and changes also our, our life and our technology. It's the, in, uh, the high, because uh, personally, uh, as, as Thomas Hales has uh, done, has solved the sphere packing problem when I was only 14 years old, you might wonder, so okay, so why do I keep working on this problem? 
And that's because dimension three is not, actually it's, uh, it's maybe the highest dimension that we are able to experience as people, but as mathematicians, we can do this uh, trick, this uh, Alice's trick on the other side of the mirror, as I explained to you, and think, okay, if we can have one, two, and three dimensions, mathematically we can also have more dimensions. And in those more dimensions, we also have, can have hyperdimensional balls. And we can also pack them. And this is something what mathematicians also thought about long way before me. In another, for example, in the 19th century, Gauss thought about sphere packings and higher dimensions. And um, uh, so th this is what people already knew about. What is actually interesting is that these higher dimensions, they give us way to see things on the hour end of the mirror. So, for example, Claude Shannon, one of the father of information theory, one of his several very important suggestions that he made was to think of a sphere packing problem as a, a model for uh, error correcting. So, whenever we are sending a signal, a signal might come in several bits, and those bits, they each of them can represent as a, a, a coordinate. And so, each signal, they think of it as a point in a multidimensional space. And so then what we know about sphere packings will actually help us to send those signals sufficiently. And so this was a great suge suge suggestion by Claude Shannon. And it was uh, because, but he was not only a theoretical uh, scientist, he actually worked for, he was a very, uh, he was also an engineer, very practical person. And so his, uh, he worked at that time at the Bell Labs and his suggestion went to, to a discovery of, uh, uh, of, uh, uh, examples of those error correcting codes and one of them very beautiful one was created by a Swiss engineer uh, Marcel Golay and it was called the Golay code and the Golay code was actually used in practice even till recently so I think right now we have a new generation of codes which has a uh, very, very high dimension but his code was 24 dimensional and uh, so it was used uh, in, in, in computers, in compact disks, in uh, space missions. Uh, and then a pure mathematician, John Leach, he read about the Golly code and what he had done that based on the Golly code, a creation of engineers, he created a Leach lattice, which actually gives us the densest sphere packing in dimension 24. And the work uh, I am known for that I was able to prove that this the sphere packing is in dimension 24 is indeed the densest and it cannot be improved. So this way we see that the strips across the mirror, they happen in both directions. So that real life is reflected in abstract ideas, abstract ideas uh, lead to new inventions and then new inventions, they actually change our world, the world around us and bring us new ideas. And maybe this is also one of the reasons why anticipating science is so difficult. It is because we have all this, as you say, we have conflicts and crises that make uh, anticipation difficult, but we also have interactions which are maybe positive and good, but they're still extremely difficult to predict. And so maybe another thing I want to say that what makes uh, abstract ideas work is the community of scientists. Because Alice feels quite lonely in that Im imaginative world. And as a scientist, actually, we, we are not alone. We are with our colleagues, with our teachers, with our students. And that's why this uh, horizontal connections between scientists are also extremely important. For example, my work on the dimension, uh, on the packing of the uh, and sphere packing in dimension 24, I've done not by myself, but I've done with a team of colleagues, with uh, Danilo Ratchenko, with uh, Steve Miller, with Abhinav Kumar and uh, Henry Kohn. And actually we all worked in different institutions at that time and met by Zoom, by Skype, occasionally in person. But still we worked on this project because we all had passion for, for higher dimensional spheres. And... Uh, uh, yeah, so this is uh, the, this picture. It's uh, actually the picture of a, a Voyager a probe, and this is a, a space mission which was sent to the space in the end of the 70s. And actually, this space probe it used the Galley code to send back its C C signal in the most efficient way. And on the right, of a uh, uh, very, very physical and very real, very applied space probe, we can see the. Uh, abstract objects or the, 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 the depiction of abstract objects, so another 
depiction of a leech lettuce. And so you see that like one would not be uh, possible without the other. And so let me uh, finish. So now I'm talking about the, about the future. So I told you only one story, so story of the sphere packing, and of course this story is not over because we have dimensions one, two, three, 24, as I told you, but we have many more. And as mathematicians, we can play here for, I think, for many, many centuries to come. And so, uh, as we already know, that it's very difficult to anticipate uh, the, the future of science, but even the future of mathematics is not that easy to predict, even though I think from all the scientists, maybe mathematics has this uh, 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 reputation of being the purest and maybe least uh, it's at least influenced by the outside world, but I hope that as I have just convinced you, it's not exactly like this. And so what are the new breakthroughs that can come in the future? And so here we have this many ideas, and some of them are our favorites, and we believe in them, and we think that they are important, and we try to push them forward. There are, of course, long-standing conjectures which come just from the logic of science, or in my case, from the logic of mathematics itself. And those are extremely important, even if they don't have an immediate application, where very often they are just the backbone of uh, mathematics, and this is what helps science grow and uh, develop itself. And of course, I would say my, maybe my first favorite horse on this slide is the one with the question mark. So this is the horse which we can say nothing about. So this is a dark horse, and it will emerge from, from all these interactions, from, maybe from applications, maybe from the theory, or maybe it will be enhanced by artificial intelligence or for, by the quantum computing, which we hope will come soon. But I think this is the horse we should really pay the most attention to, and also maybe as a last thing, we should not maybe focus too much on those who are now, now favorites for, for at the moment, because this horse with a question mark, I think it is probably the one that will make the most difference, not only to the mathematics, but also to the world. So, thank you.